Now let's look at something else that comes out of the costing methods part of the syllabus. What we want to look at next is something called target costing. Target costing is a very simple idea. At the same stage, it is very powerful and heavily used by most manufacturers nowadays. So what is it? Well, the argument with target costing is this. Most products are sold within a highly competitive environment. From that perspective, are we, as the company selling the product, able to dictate the price? Well, no, the answer cannot be yes. So from that perspective, target costing starts at the prevailing market price that we can expect to sell the good and works backwards to establish the cost at which we must produce it. So it goes something like this. Step one. We identify the price at which the product may be sold. Now, what sort of things will impact on that price? Well, of course, things such as the specification of the product. When I say specification here, I mean the gadgets that the product may offer. If we could separate it from the specification, the quality of the product, and of course, the marketplace as well. The state of the market. So, once we've established this price, we can then go one step back. The next step is to say, well, hold on a moment. If this is the price, how much margin or return do we want? So we identify the required margin. I suppose we're talking about profit margin here, although it could be a cash flow measure or any measure that the examiner would want. And then step three, once we've got our margin and we already know our price, we can establish our target cost. The target cost is simply going to equal the price minus the required margin. I don't know about you, but a lot of people think of this as cost plus pricing in, re in reverse. Cost plus, we get the cost, we add the margin, and hence establish the price. If you want to look at target costing, aren't we do doing precisely the opposite to that? We get the price, establish the margin, and from that determine the cost. Right. Now, we've got this far, but hold on a moment. We've established a cost at which we must be able to produce the product. But remember, chances are that the actual cost pace at which we could presently produce the product is likely to be higher than that. So step four is the fun bit. What we've said here is very straightforward, very simple. Step four is what the examiner wants us to talk about. Step four, we must close the gap. And what do you think the gap is? Well, the gap is the difference between the actual cost base as it stands at the moment and the target cost base, the one that we want. So how do we do this? Well, the first thing we have to identify is this. We must do target costing before 
we start producing the product. Because once the product's in production, we really can't save that much on the basis that the way that we produce it and the components that go into the product are already determined. So the first thing we have to do is remember that we close the gap at the design stage. In effect, we attempt to reduce our cost base by designing out the costs, by trying to produce the same product at the same specification, but with fewer costs associated with that production. Now, of course, target costing has had many books written about it. We're not going to go into this in vast detail. But at the same stage, how do we reduce the cost of producing a product? Well, there are two basic ways that we can go about it. And then there's a third, maybe slightly less appropriate manner. Whenever I look at target costing, the two, com two aspects that I focus on are one. Firstly, we try to produce the same product but with fewer components. We reduce the component count. We redesign the product so the same product can be produced but with fewer bits. And the second thing we try and do is we reduce production complexity. All I mean by this is that we attempt to make the same product, but in an easier manner. The third one, which I'm less happy about, but the examiner has already suggested is acceptable, is that we may revise the specification. But of course, if we revise the specification too far, then we get into a situation where our original price that we set is inappropriate. So we have to be slightly careful about that. Well, okay, we talked about this in abstract. Now let's just try and reflect how ubiquitous this sort of idea has become. The examples I talk about go back many years. My favorite example is where we have swatch watches. They were introduced somewhere near the back end of the 70s, early 80s. They were the Swiss government's way of trying to get their manufacturers to compete with cheap Japanese imports. Now, they came up with various requirements of the watch that they were launching. It had to have hands rather than be digital and things like that. But beyond that, they were looking for a cool new design, whether it is or it's not is nothing of my concern, that they could produce within the cost base and hence meet the target price. In order to achieve this, they identified two points. First of all, that they had to be able to produce the product with 40 components. And secondly, that we produce it from one side. Now, I know nothing about watch manufacture, but apparently normally you would prepare a watch by manufacturing it from two sides. Now, it took them two and a half years of design in order to get the original component count from something like 60 components to something near 40 components. They didn't quite make it, but they got to 41 or 42 components. And yes, they managed to produce the product from one side and hence simplify dramatically the type of machinery that they needed. Another example, Mercedes, to all intents and purposes, had the top end of the car market to themselves for many years. They didn't really care until a few years back, Toyota decided to launch a top brand. They launched a brand called Lexus that to all intents and purposes had the same quality levels as Mercedes. And what scared Mercedes was the fact 
that Mercedes were spending many thousands more on each car that they made than Lexus. This puts them in a very vulnerable position. Because, of course, if they just compete one for one, Toyota, Lexus, will make loads more money on each car that they make. Or in the event of a price war, you know Lexus will always win. So, Mercedes introduced an E-Class, adopting simple target costing techniques. They managed to reduce the component count by 40%. Now, I don't know how many components go into a car, but I suppose if the previous car had 2,000 components, they can produce the same car with 1,200. And this was purportedly, at least reportedly, leading to a $2,000 saving per car as a result. Now, that's quite an impressive saving. So these are the sort of things that illustrate how target costing works. Please note, you will have to discuss target costing. At the same stage, don't get too worried about the numbers, because there are no numbers per se that will come out of target costing. We can now look at something called life cycle costing. Now, life cycle costing is attempting to reflect how things have changed in recent years. You see, if we look at the way manufacturing is going, there are two compelling features that affect the way that we, as accountants, can measure the costs of products. The two features... Firstly, shorter product life cycles. The length of time between a product being introduced and the product being withdrawn is getting ever shorter in any area of manufacture. And secondly... <laughs> Increased initial costs. Now, I'll keep it nice and simple here, but I suppose what I mean by initial costs are the costs of research and development, the costs of fitting out new factories, the costs of launching a new product. Now, both of these come together to make it very difficult when it comes to linking the costs of development against the product to which they relate. Now, I don't care about the appropriate IAS and what we do with development costs, amortization or otherwise. What I care about here is that we find some way of recouping those costs over the life of the product. Because if we don't, we could easily get into a situation where we launch many products, but none of them have a sufficiently long life cycle. You know, from when we introduce them to when we withdraw them, to make it worthwhile us in introducing the products in the first place. To give you an indication of how things have changed, shorter product life cycles. If you look at some of the early cars that were manufactured, things like the VW Beetle was manufactured for over 60 years. The Mini was manufactured for over 40 years. Now, a typical product life cycle of one of the core cars manufactured today can be sh as short as six years and maybe even four before a major revamp or change. Four years on a car that will require very substantial investment in terms of research and development and tooling Maybe the biggest example of all is to look at the computer industry. Now, my example is slightly out of date, but I, th I still think it is pertinent. If you look at developing a new chip, you know, the sort of chip that goes in your laptop or PC. It costs something like $1 billion to develop the chip. That's just design it. It costs something like $1 billion for each fabrication plant that they build. 
to make the ship. So you're investing $2 billion before you begin to make one chip. And how long before that chip will be superseded by the next computer chip? Well, typically, they say they've got 12 to 18 months. So hold on a moment. This is pretty scary, isn't it? We've invested $2 billion, and based on that investment, we've got to recoup that money in the 12 to 18 months before the next product is launched. So life cycle costing, what are the issues? The first issue is ensuring costs are recouped during the product life. So I suppose the issue is we've got to be very careful to know what the product cost is. Because if we don't know the product cost, we may price wrongly. Secondly, understand the cost from year to year. If we're not careful, we may try to spread the costs over each year, but not reflecting the expected number of units. For example, in a launch year where we don't sell that many units, a high cost, low level of units will mean a very high cost base, which we could not sustain. If, however, we looked at it over the whole life of the pro product, and hence took all of the units, we are more likely to come up with a sensible product cost. Now, after all of this nonsense, there is only one thing we really have to reflect. We need the life cost per unit. And to get the life cost per unit, we will take the initial costs. Whatever they may be, research and development, developing the factory, anything of that nature, to which we take all the production costs. You know, materials, labor, and things like that. And we divide through by the estimated life units. So it's a very simple calculation. All of the costs for the life of the product over all of the units for the life of the product. Nothing more, nothing less. So when you see a life cycle cost in question, any numbers in that question will not be difficult. There will be nothing of any concern whatsoever. And all we have to do is to be aware of the basic sort of environment. I think we can all appreciate that there are many industries which have precisely this sort of issue.